Aha! Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our now much more regular uh, Tuesday stream. I had to think for a second there. <laughs> I nearly said Monday. It is not Wednesday, my dudes. It is not Wednesday. It is not Monday. It is, in fact, Tuesday, if you are not aware. You're here for the hard-hitting news. That's the hard-hitting news. Yes. <laughs> but we also need to say, we're back. Yes, we are back. Uh, the weather's just a bit dull, really. It's dull. It's a bit damp. It smells weirdly. You know, you know, like stale air sometimes. It smells stale outside for some reason. Well, I always think of it as like <laughs> when, it, when it's grey... Overcast. Yes. Less than about ten miles an hour in wind, and the occasional bit of rain. It's almost like non weather. It's anti weather. Anti anti weather. Yeah, it's like there's such a proliferance of just like guff in the air that there's almost a high pressure zone of it. But yes, um, uh, before we go any further, I will say thank you to all of our members. I see a few of you there in the chat. Thank you, S. Smith. Thank you, Anthony Keen. Thank you, Not Sure. And thank you, Rick, there as well. Um, oh, I will remind you that we are still monetized somehow. Yes. So if you want to drop us a uh, a little bit of a uh, some shekels, you can do via YouTube, or you can do so uh, via Ko-Fi, which is the one that takes the smallest cut. Or if you want to support us more regularly, you can either subscribe as a member of the channel or as a member of the Substack, yes. which there is a number of options for. And it also means you can get this as a podcast that I believe you can download. Yes, you can download it. You can you can do as you please with it, really. It's an ad-free podcast for all of our all of our uh, Substack members, along with all of our extensive research notes. <clears throat> but we shall not, we shall not shill too much longer because this is a slightly more slightly more personal stream i suppose yes i mean i coincidentally i suppose especially as as ever stuff kind of got popularized over the last year or so when we've been interacting with woes and other people i think there's a lot of folk have become quite sort of confused yes and aren't entirely sure what it is that we are what we either have believed in or do currently believe in and what sort of pathway we've come through i also want to say thank you to uh, spasticus autisticus there <laughs> great for, name for giving away five subscriptions he obviously can't be that much of a spastic yes. if he knows to give five subscriptions away to such a marvelous well, channel membership. like this yes uh, uh, called memberships evelyn no, no <laughs> and uh, like and comment and subscribe and member and yes. hit the bell I, and... do you member i member but yes <laughs> it's <laughs> well, this will be a kind of an expansion on a, a Substack piece you wrote Quite, quite a while ago. This almost, was, almost a year ago. Almost a year out. ago to the day. Um, tell you what, actually, to give you a flavour of what we're talking about, do you just want to read through this quickly, Evelyn? Yes, I think I shall. Um, and we can kind of go from there, because it really this is the background you come from, and it's the background actually quite a lot of... This background AA comes from as well in certain ways. And, and not to... I think not to brag, yes. I had done a lot of reading around libertarianism, the subjects around it, and economics in large part, Sort of before we started doing any of this stuff. Yes. So I kind of threw you in the deep end of this stuff for about a year or so and then came to a realisation myself that it does not answer all the questions and then threw you in a completely different deep end. <laughs> well, basically, yes. But the, the the type of libertarianism we're talking about today, won't even be, we won't even be taking some easy swipes at the lulbits. We'll be effectively, well, I guess what people call steel manning the libertarian mm. position, we'll be looking at its maximalist version, we'll be looking at kind of Misesian, Mises Institute, late Rothbardian, paleo-libertarianism. Like, the hardest libertarianism you can get. Yes, but I, I think we should just, we'll start anyway. Yes. Uh, this article starts with a fantastic quote from James Burnham's Struggle for the World, which yes. is a good book and everyone should read. That's been used, uh, I think, three times on the <laughs> Substack now. Uh, I used it once at least. Oh no, the quotes from that book we've used yes. a few times, yes, because there's some very poignant stuff in it. Power politics is the only kind of politics there is. The idea of some sort of politics that would not be power politics is empty, self-contradictory. When someone condemns power politics, it is a sign either that he does not know what politics is about, or that he is objecting to someone else's power politics while simultaneously camouflaging his own. The term authoritarian is used frequently to describe elements of the regime's actions that we do not like 
or feel as unnecessary in solving the problems of the day. Whilst many feel that such a label critiques the nature of a policy, it does no such thing. At best, to suggest that a leader or a group of leaders are authoritarian is to suggest that they have a power-hungry attitude. But this too is redundant. All leaders by their nature must be power-hungry, otherwise they wouldn't be leaders. Another more power-hungry individual or group would take up the reins instead. At worst, authoritarianism is juxtaposed against what must be taken as unauthoritarian politics. This is of course nonsense, as the ever quotable James Burnham tells us above. There can be no such thing as non-power politics. A body that exercises political authority must maintain and grow its power through technical means, subterfuge or outright force. Otherwise, it is an authority in decline. A subsidiary or a future subsidiary of some other great power. I could read the next one. Uh, readers more familiar with my profile, or Evelyn's profile online, will understand that my intellectual journey took off from libertarianism, of a more rightward lean, and developed into anarcho capitalism, a view which still influences me uh, today. I guess that's less so now, but in a way that many seem to miss. In my journey through libertarianism, without my direct knowledge at the time, I began to question any and all central or monopolizing authorities in the political world, be it divine right of kings, technical competency, or its ill-thought cousin, ill-thought-up cousin, uh, might makes right, and latterly the legitimizing filter of the democratic mandate. Each one in my mind has challenged uh, and subsequently smashed. Um, the last in the works... Right. The last in the works of Hans Herbert Hopper, who took the democratic worldview uh, to task, is such a brilliant manner that I uh, credit the Democracy of the God that Failed um, as akin to an epiphany. And it is a very good book. I will, I will still recommend people Democracy of the God that Failed because it is, in terms of critiquing democracy purely, I think that oh, it's Ho fantastic. Hopper and the other, we've got this meme as well, <laughs> Hopper and the other paleo libertarians are at their best when they are at war with somebody else's ideology effectively. When they are at war with ideology itself, I think paleo-libertarian theory is extremely powerful. But when it tries to consolidate, when it tries to say what it is and what it believes, it often dissolves into waffle anyway. Yes. Divine right of kings fell to liberal regimes centered around individual actualization. The liberal regimes fell to the technical supremacy of the early managerial regime. Technical supremacy alone fell to the more developed and matured empire of democracy and pluralism. In my joy about learning of these subsequent revolutions and argue about them for hours on end with my peers, I lost sight of the most revealing component. In my haste to denounce all monopolising forces and to be seen as the wrinkliest brain in the room, I never <laughs> suspected that all politics was really just about power, and power alone. If one takes the anarcho-capitalist lens and tweak it just so, everything rational, moral or democratic within politics dissolves into raw power relations. To realise that authoritarian is not the cry of the well-meaning freedom fighter, but that of the Machiavellian who wishes to subjugate the current powers under his own boot. Given his want to succeed, likely a bigger and spikier boot at that. There is no compromise in politics. Conciliation only exists for the groups who are already routed and subjugated, more often than not leading to dependence on the ruling group. Legitimate regimes, in any true sense, do not exist. Regimes are legitimate only in the moment and legitimacy is demonstrated only in its effective use of power. Attempting to argue over what regimes across time and place are legitimate in comparison to others is a matter solely of taste and preference. If you're the sort who believes genuinely that one one an, oh, uh, sorry, if you are the sort who believes genuinely that one or another regime truly has an intellectual claim to legitimacy, then I must introduce you to the ancient democratic <laughs> institution of gang rape. <laughs> and this really is sort of a long-winded explanation of the thing that yes. AA beats people around the head with. You know, BS, BS, therefore I rule. Yes, it is. You know, the whole thing is not the context of what, that which you use to rule. It is the fact that you rule. And this, you know, seems like a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, but that's ultimately because that's what it is. 
Yes. And I think it takes a certain amount of intellectual fortitude to actually come full circle and realise all of these aspects of morality and rationalizations and explanations of why, you know, one form of government is better than another are meaningless. It can only be demonstrated in its, in its results. And then even then, it can't really be measured in terms of was that good or is that bad? It's only, is that effective or is it not? Yes. There's a quick kind of discussion point here. And I'll ask, to be fair, I'll ask people in chat as well, if you want to donate or not, uh, feel free. But why do you think that libertarianism struggles so much with power when it seems to excel in certain other areas of theory <clears throat> to such a degree? Because there are, I think, very good and very complete areas, especially within the paleo-libertarian framing. We'll, we'll we talk about that a bit later, but it really all falls down when it comes to legitimacy. Because as we've discussed, the legitimacy of a ruler is one, based on their ability to wield power, but two, it is also based on who they are. Mm. Political theory cannot come into contact with the real world because the real world is run by people. Well, this is, this is why, and I know someone's mentioned it in chat there about Pete Q being their kind of way of libertarianism. I mean, I, I, I don't want to make myself wholly responsible for all of that, but I do feel in large part I was there in an early sort of influence in bringing essentially Leninism as an extra sort of political lens on top of elements of libertarian theory that we already had, because it does ask that fundamental question. It's not about why they're ruling or what they rule, but who rules and who is benefited by it. <laughs> I'll quickly say thank you for the five pounds there from Time Stealer. He says eating dinner late, so I finally get to listen to uh, live to friends. Will you touch on why so many libertarians are married to Asian women? Uh, no, no, we will not. You dirty, dirty bugger. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Time Stealer. Many Stealer. such cases. Many such cases. You are a good friend of the channel, though. <laughs> who slash whom but yes it is politics is about the people mm. it's it's uh, all the libertarian theory in the world all the anarcho-capitalist theory in the world can't deal with the fact that a good king is better than a bad king mm. there is no political theory really that can deal with the granular quality of leaders because that's not something that comes from theory that's something that comes from the immutable traits of humanity and the immutable traits of the kind of people who should rule power. And without the elite theory aspect, without the ideas that there should be a permanent ruling elite, because there has to be, because that is one of the immutable facts of human civilization. Yes, and we've made a lot of use, I mean, we can briefly mention here, for those of you who are in the chat and are probably of the very new variety... One of the first things we really embarked on when we did the stuff on this channel was a series called Democratization. Yes. And we used the framework of paleo-libertarianism as a large part of our backdrop for that. And we sort of, you can see really across what was, must have been nearly the best part of a year that I sat and wrote up yes. a lot of the stuff for that, that we sort of came out of it somewhat. But paleo-libertarianism, at least, you know, in the Hoppian form and later Rothbard recognises there will always be elites so they should at least be you know good or honourable elites or whatever Yes, and that's useful but I think it misses a component and I'm going to go on a small, small segue here but you'll see where I'm going in a sec I managed to get myself blocked by one uh, Constantine Kissin of Trigonometry the other week <laughs> because he'd made a tweet essentially suggesting that aren't we all lucky to live in the west and I said, you know, th this is the modern man incarnate. Nationhood is a matter of chance and consequence, not destiny. Yes. And that is the one element where someone like Hopper, even though he's a you know, monarchist and natural elites and very hardcore about defending property rights and all this stuff, he still butts up to the fact that you can't then Im impute this sort of subjectivist element of destiny or fate or glory, or imperium, whatever you want to call it, but that little extra activating element that really motivates people politically. Yes. And this is, you know, a large part of, I believe, uh, 
what's discussed in Pareto before he gets to all the, the nitty gritty bits of elite theory is that there are these what's the term he uses uh, d derivation not der derivations well, I can't remember the name of it but you know there are like three or four motivating characteristics for people Yes, and that these are the things that push them into engaging with power and power relations over other people sentiments yes thank you Thank you. Thank you to our elite uh, theory reading audience there. It's, it's sentiments or de derivations or something like that. Yeah, I believe it's sentiments. But I uh, do continue. Well, it's just, again, that with that elite theory, he is at least giving scope. He's not saying what the subjective element is. No. But he's giving scope to, like, look, here's this subjectivist element, and that is the animating principle for why people engage in politics. Yes. Whereas... Especially in a lot, a, a, the vast majority of libertarian theory, there's an attempt to essentially depoliticize and become unpolitics. Well, um, we found even with the hardest edge stuff we could find in this framework that we were really butting up against the well, the, really the containment bubble that was again that even the most disavowed areas of libertarian theory. Its hardest edge historical framework is both underused because it's disavowed by a lot of people who are libertarians and hemmed in by the ultimate backstops of boomer truth. Yes. Make of that what you will. Uh, it also misunderstands that human cooperation requires hierarchies we'll get into. But the, the issue that we found when we were researching the democratization stuff that we all found really, you know, trade contributed some stuff, I contributed some stuff, you contributed most of it, I would say. Yeah, did, for people who don't know, Evelyn didn't just come out of nowhere as a co-host. I basically <laughs> sat her down and made her write like a 12 part uh, epic about democracy. Um, be be before she was allowed on the channel, <laughs> which, basically. Which will some someday elements of it will become a book when I manage to find the right headspace to actually do that whenever that arises. But yes, a lot of the... And I there's a great series of videos from Academic Agent, and I can't quite remember the name of them, but in a very similar sense, it's sort of the, the problem with libertarian arguments against all these different ideologies. And a large part is that the there is still a fundamental piece of egalitarianism to it. There yes. Is, and that reflects the sort of utilitarian foundations that it is all predicated upon. That, oh, well, if we have the maximal freedom for the maximum number of people and there is an equal access to freedom for all people, then this must result in a good outcome. Yes. No, not necessarily. Because no. if you are a reactionary and you're not bothered about happiness, but you're bothered about vitalism and heroism and elites proper, not yes. what the rest of the populace feels like the best of the best are doing and what they are, then utilitarian aggregations mean absolutely nothing. No, they don't. And as I keep teasing for people, I'm still trying to work on what I'd consider my framework of... of uh, Carl Schmidt, the peacemaker, which is basically the idea that if if all politics is combat, then politicizing people is awful. Yes, <laughs> uh, and just a longer form of that, really. Um, thank you to uh, Coney Current Year, long time support of the channel for the five pounds. The real question is, who are the best people to rule um, instead of the MTC, and uh, can paleo libertarians provide the right BSBS to justify their rule? Well, our answer to that really is no, because they, they would rather turn inwards on each other and themselves rather than speak. A lot of people criticise us for being axiomatic in certain ways, for having, as we have here, mantras and... What's the guy called that you referenced? He was uh, a... Uh, a Nicolas Gomez Davila and his aphorisms. Yeah, yeah, aphorisms as well. But we found that when trying to thin-end the wedge, because really what democratization is, is our attempt to make a paleo-libertarian maximalist wedge. Yes. To bring people in with, you know, the, the Federal Reserve stuff and the conspiracy of money stuff and to really batter the myths of history. And we thought about integrating people like Thomas Sowell into it as an easy start. We thought about trying to integrate a bit more of Peter Hitchens, even though his stuff was more useful on other topics. And we found really that a lot of the thin end of the wedge was wrong. 
you were teaching people wrong and having to reteach them as you go up the wedge, which we found was completely counterproductive. Well, yeah, I'm gonna. This isn't in the the notes we've got for the stream, but this is in the massive like fourteen, fifteen page document that is all the stuff I want to book one day. Yes, but I've got. Mises and Rothbard will mock and scorn the socialist idea of every man being a Gotha or a Wagner in the socialist world. Yes. That because they've been released of the the disutility of labour by the socialist utopia, that they will become they will all become artists. But they all cling still fully to the notion that realised individuals in the liberal marketplace become actualised and able to freely choose specialisation into a manner which suits them perfectly. And that to me seems like the exact same statement. And you must ask yourself, you know, can all people fully realise themselves as individuals? No. no. <laughs> is the freedom to choose spe is the freedom to choose specialisation really freedom? No. And is it right to even let people choose in the first place? Probably not. There's the, always the issue of the, of the people who don't use degrees thing I always think about. Mm. That people spend years of their lives effectively wasting it. And many people who go into academia wish that they can get those years back. And that is the modern consequence of it. It's, the problem is that, yes, a lot of the time you would be more productive pushing a plough. Uh, maybe that means you should push one. <laughs> maybe it's not. Well, this is what I mean. When we when we get rid of the standards of economy and utilitarianism, yes, it doesn't even factor into the equation because how can you argue that being a specialised technical labourer that has to go through seventeen years of schooling, four years of additional schooling on top of that, and maybe four or five years of training on a job, yes, where's the freedom there? Where's the freedom to, as you say, just become someone that ploughs a field? So, and this isn't to say that there should always be freedom, but more that freedom in this regards is meaningless, really. It, it, because you are yeah. subject to the conditions of the world you are in. Well, it's a long way of explaining that freedom is completely subjective. Mm. And it's something we've gone into before, that in the mind of the Afghani goat farmer, freedom to sit in a cave and read the Quran is his ultimate freedom. He does not want to vote. He does not want to become the mass man. He wants to live a simple life and he wants to be religious. And that is the impulse in many places. And it, it, what we talk about in democratization really is that idea that the, what is good is completely subjective. Mm. And that if you talk about good and bad and good and evil, yes, you can talk about that, but you are making a value judgment. Yes. And you must know that you are making a value judgment. And things cannot be objectively good governance. It's, yeah. it's one of the basic principles we talk about. That freedom is such an abstraction that without it be, and I think this is actually one of Davila's aphorisms as well. Yes. You know, freedom of its own is a fool's errand. It's always the freedom to do something, which isn't freedom, it's power. Yes. Well, what we talk about is there is a tendency to throw the baby out with the bathwater ideologically. We try not to go, oh, libertarianism, it's all terrible, it's all bad, it's all awful, oh, conservatism, it's all awful, it's all bad, because within, within both of those areas you have people like Paul Gottfried and Sam Francis as pale libertarians. Despite people's protestation, you still have a lot of good stuff like we talked about with violence in society, with Rothbard and some of his maximalist kill your local drug dealer stuff. Mm. You've got a lot of good stuff, I think, in Mises I've, and there's a lot of good theory for people. Everyone but, should read Democracy the God That Failed. Yes. I, would, I would not say otherwise in that front. But uh, what, then... what you're seeing in the background of these images, by the way, is uh, Evelyn's attempts at uh, hop well, basically the hoppy and Leninism. Yes, the hoppy and Leninism, slightly tongue-in-cheek stuff about trying to get people to think about power and think in more revolutionary terms. <clears throat> but it's it, it's this stuff, and we don't want to abandon where we've come from. We don't want to abandon the ideas that formed a lot of the basis of what we talk about because they are quite foundational what we talk about on this channel. It's just that you have to recognise that political theory only carries you so far. Yes, and as you, as we can go on to the further part, and maybe we could just read through this piece as well. I don't see why oh, no, we no. shouldn't. <clears throat> um, we, we've, we've talked about this in the stream before. It's one No, of no, our, I, think, uh, I think we could read through it, though, because it's very relevant to what we're about to go on to, which is that libertarian theory then becomes a sort of, like, 
an autistic filter for making you incapable of understanding how human cooperation actually works? Well, the, the problem is that, like I say in here in the notes, that my contention with paleo libertarianism is that even though it is supposed to be the most pure and self-contained form of its ideology, it is still woefully incomplete and far too focused on economics. It's very good if you want to do really granular uh, analysis on economic systems, econometrics, and, and really undercut that stuff in really, really fine detail. Mm. But as a totalizing idea of how you organize a society, it is woefully incomplete in my view. It, it does not have responses to certain things. It hand waves certain things away in the same way that Marxism does. A lot of what libertarian theory ends up talking about is almost like the Marxist idea of false consciousness. Mm. It, you almost, you, well, you do paint yourself into a corner when you talk about things like aggression and violence and not understanding those two things, as we'll get onto with your, with your nap stuff. But um, if you want to give this one a quick read, feel free, yeah. because this is, uh, this is our... It's a very, very quick one. It's just one of our uh, mantras for surviving modernity. It's he who says cooperation says hierarchy. And I realise that since we now have a much larger audience than we used to, many of you will never have heard this before yes, as well. Yes, so we'll, we'll quickly go through this. Sure. Uh, hierarchy is the only way to understand human interaction. Cooperation is nothing but an obfuscatory cope. Hierarchy is a grand metaphysic that man has been in touch with for longer than we can really say. Back when slavery and service were authentic relationships, it was clear to all men that they served in the great chain of being from the lowest serf to the highest lord, all below God. Even notions of charity and forgiveness from the Christian faith have underneath them the metaphysic of hierarchy. Charity requires one to have more to give than the other. Forgiveness speaks to the existence of individuals of a higher moral or societal standing. Cooperation, on the other hand, is enlightenment waffle. It is a false and corrupted metaphysic which cannot be factored into the tragic vision of life and the world around us that was held in traditional times. The notion that human behaviour can be wholly cooperative in origin and that this can be a guiding principle for wider societal organisation is false. It is this falsehood that has evolved into diseases that are now known today as liberalism and democracy. In liberal democracy, you are not working with your elites, you are working for them and convincing yourself otherwise, because as moderns, this is all we know. Elites will always rule, no matter what we call it, democracy, monarchy, republicanism, etc. These are all just different ways of saying an organised minority rules over the unorganised masses and that orders, communication, and ruling legitimacy flow in one direction, from the rulers down to the ruled. In the modern world, you are still a serf, arguably stripped of holdings, faith, and nation, you are lesser. Topped off with the inability to recognise your place in the great chain of being, instead, one has nothing else but self-serving psychological mantras reinforcing your social standing as being the same as that of your masters. We are all in this together. Hierarchy and the virtue of service could be restored to the effect of ridding many modern social ills, but this would have to be a restoration through and through. Almost every crisis of identity politics can be solved by the application of hierarchy across ser um, and service across sexual and racial lines. This of course requires a vitalist western patriarchal force organised, willing and able to rule in this fashion. Unless we ourselves can mould this ruling class, then we must wait for its miraculous return by other means. Modern man rejects hierarchy because he has never seen it. He only knows obfuscation, misdirection and conciliation for Machiavellian ends. Absolute authority till the end of one's day or a duty to be done on pain of death, these horrify our peers because they believe strongly that their life belongs to them. And that said, life is all, uh, and that said, life is all that will ever be. Yes, it it really is the eternal. It's the eternal adolescence of the boomer mind. I talk about in when I talk about the boomer question, 
and the fact that really every single generation since 1945 has been completely stripped of the ideas of personal responsibility and that we are all boomers now. Mm. Every generation after the boomers is much more similar to them than the generations before them. And it's the same with really the turn of the 19th century. All generations after the turn of the 19th century are very different to the generations beforehand. They become very abstracted. They become very removed from the immediacy of life. A lot of that is to do with the fact that they don't, they don't live on the land anymore, they don't keep animals anymore, and they don't see the cycle of life and death anymore. But you're right, it's these things that traumatise people. In the, you are less concerned about the minutia of life and the minutia of political systems if you understand, in a, in a real sense, from keeping animals, that you will die. Well, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to borrow another one from Davila. Yes. Heaven is a hierarchy. Hell is a quality. Yes. <laughs> it's a very, very good one. Shall we get on to talking a bit more about money, though, yes, and economics? I suppose because, of course, a large part of libertarian theory, and my inroads into it, was economics. Well, mo I'd say most of libertarian theory is some form of economics. Well, yeah, it's, it's the wider understanding of praxeology, and the predication is that because there are mutually beneficial relationships that can, in theory, happen in economics that one can then build a complex society out of an ever-growing network of mutually beneficial exchanges. And I think on the face of that, that sounds very nice. And it's a handy tool for teaching people, to an extent. Yes. But I think as a foundation for understanding human behaviour, it's not enough. No, I will quickly say thank you for the two pounds there, Belfast Knight. You're a long time supporter of the channel. I've seen you quite a few times before. Uh, but how does this affect you personally? <laughs> so, very good there. But I, I put a little quote on screen. I'm a little bit ahead here, but I, this is really my thought about it. It's that start, stating that the money is fake in an ever more elaborate way is a waste of energy when people will either intuitively accept that fact or reject it. You can't make the horse drink. I'd, I, would, I would even be more cynical than this. I would suggest that trying to explain to 99% of people the logical consequences of what it means when a money is fake yeah. isn't feasible. No. A lot of, to be fair, a lot of people don't need to know that anyway. <laughs> like, yes. You don't need to know very dense libertarian theory to know that fiat money isn't real and that it isn't money. No. Really. Uh, you can understand that intuitively without understanding that theoretically. It's like how people can understand some like mass energy equivalents without reading the proof for it. <laughs> it's, mm. it you, you can understand concepts without understanding all of the granular base principles behind it. And libertarianism, unfortunately, doesn't seem to grasp that in many ways. Or at least libertarians don't. Well, this is, <laughs> this is why some of us sort of struggled with it for so long because so much of what libertarian is is still bottom-up theory. Yes, it is. The other end of the spectrum is not so much when it's critiquing, but when it's trying to build its own system of how it's going to engage in the world as a set of ideas. The first point is always, well, it's education. If you mass-educate the people on libertarian issues, then they'll understand and they'll get up and they'll revolt. But we know this. This fantasy is called democracy. And it's not true. No. We've talked about economics in the past. I think the most complete thing we've done in economics was part of the democratization series, which is a, a three-hour video about basically Keynesian economics and how it, this is what Keynesians actually believe. Yes. This is kind of your economics magnum opus, in my opinion. This is you <laughs> just going through and using very, very basic, kind of intuitive things to point out the fact that you don't have the information to plan an economy. No. And the Keynesianism is just a planned economy. It's a Soviet-style planned economy. It, it is a, a different form of it, but it is a form well, of see, it. Again, though, I would, I would take a different stance on this than I would take then, because I would say that anything that is a mass economy, and because it has an unorganised mass, must be planned and organised by an elite. Yes, and this is a sort of counterintuitive idea that I'm not sure many people have really put back into their economic analysis. No. Because I, I can remember coming towards the end point of my stuff for libertarianism. I used to frame it as like a, 
you know, anarcho totalitarianism or anarcho fascism. <laughs> yeah. We will force you to be free. <laughs> well, it is. It's you end up with these bizarre conceptions where the only way to guarantee perfect libertarian theory is by like absolute monarchy or something like that. Well, yeah, and I mean the the strategy that was put forward by Hopper is that you have a a counter elite class. And they spend as much effort as they can building themselves up to be as powerful as they can. And they, they spend all their efforts on delegitimizing democracy, which is a cornerstone of the modern liberal state. And I think in a large part that holds true. But the libertarian theory in and of itself is not the way to go about that. No, and it also doesn't contend with the fact that everybody can believe democracy is fake whilst living in a democracy. Yes. <laughs> and well, the- I mean, if you ask the average person on the street, yeah, you know, do you really think they count every single one of those ballots? <laughs> what would the answer be for the majority of people? Uh, no, probably not. Yeah. Do, do you really do you actually think your vote matters? Yeah, I mean, this is most people don't. I mean, this is an extension of another sort of short, almost mantra esque point we've talked about, which is the, the you know the masses being red pilled. The masses are already red pilled because they have to live in reality too, especially people who are nominally working class. Yes. You you have to live in reality, so you have to know things about it. They know blacks <laughs> have a preponderance to crime. Yes. They know subsets of, shall we say, alternative life choices have a preponderance for touching kids. Yes. They know about Epstein. They know about all sorts of different conspiracy theory elements. And a vast majority of them as well, if you really talk to them after a drink or two, know that those people that took the vaccine are going to have dicky hearts yeah. in a while. But they can't act upon those beliefs. No, there's, there's... And that's that's the important part. It's not about what you know, what you believe, or what you say. It's your ability to manifest that into action and will in some sort of sense. <laughs> I'll, I'll, put, I'll put that back on screen. But I always love this image because it's a great example of incongruity. If, if you were to become like a Hoppian maximalist, you would end up being like caveman, cave beard man. Mm. <laughs> you would end up basically as Osama bin Laden. It's it's quite funny that it, it a lot of people who are ANCAPs nominally, they talk like Islamists whilst behaving like wine moms. It's bizarre. Yes. It's this bizarre disconnect between the rhetoric of what someone in chat kind of referred to as the why can't everyone be a middle class, middle educated white man like me that Ankapistan would work? Yes, so exactly. Like, well, Ankapistan doesn't work because not everyone is a middle class rationalist uh, just about college educated white men and it do, and it will never will be <laughs> well i mean i would i would actually take less of an issue with it if some of them just came forward and said look there'll be no anarcho capitalism without some sort of social arrangement within it for the majority of people that looks like slavery and it would it would in a sort of weird sense almost become like an ancient greek democracy Yes. There are the democratic, the demos, the class of people who rule themselves in a libertarian... The decisionary class, yeah, yes. Who rule themselves in a libertarian ideal that maybe make up 1% of the total population and then everyone else lives well, in some form of contractual serfdom. That might be your ANCAP view that works, but other than that, I don't see it happening. Unfortunately, that's, that's already existed. It was a place called medieval Europe. Oh, no, I know about that too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great, but... Um... Ah oh, dear. Well, we'll we'll get off this before I end up talking Sorry, too get, much about uh, too much about. Quick, uh, Allah Akbar. <laughs> but the the other side of the coin as well is that some of the people we've known from this kind of sphere, how kind of I don't know. I would say I was in the fact that they've kind of gone down some lines of thought that I think's a bit of a waste of time and a bit counterproductive. Yes. Trying to shoehorn libertarian issues and libertarian ideas into current discussions in a way that's oh we're anti-woke, it's the culture war, here's how libertarians have only the true answer to the culture war, it's like well you had your intellectual tradition, it stood for what it stood for you could spend your time developing it and turning it into something genuinely cutting edge and new or you could rehash the same ideas over and over again and talk about how you're going to put the trunes away or something. And to me, that doesn't seem like a great use of time, especially when some of the people getting picked up by the Institute now seem to think that their primary 
goal is to go on a crusade against anti-Semitism. Yes, but, but that's of a course, different topic for a different. Day. Of course, we love the nation of Israel. Okay, um, oh, I, oh, yes. <laughs> we, 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 of course, are devoted to the nation of Israel here. Um, yes, we, we usually at Farage do our uh, our dedications for us, but we'll give him a rest this week because I'm sick of the sight of him. To be Democracy honest. in Israel now. <laughs> Down but, with Netanyahu. You, you've been to the Mises Institute. You know, you raised funds at one point to go to the Mises yes. Institute and talk to people. And there's been very good people involved in it. But not to put anyone shit in the street, but there's certain people who have been heavily involved with it that have basically left in disgust and said that they wish they hadn't wasted their time. Yes. <laughs> there's been a, a lot of, I think, in the current political climate, there's a lot of despair when it comes to the ideas of paleo-libertarianism by people who understand them fully, like you've had, and like Pete, you know, Quinona's had, and other people have had, because you end up going 95% of the way there, and then you realise you're falling short, but you don't have the political theory. Oh, look at that, all the love hearts for it. <laughs> yeah. give, give us a few love hearts in, a, in the chat for Israel, please. <laughs> That's terrible. But yes, I, I mean, I think one of the... <clears throat> one of the biggest nails in the coffin was... COVID. Yes. You know, COVID should have been really, if, if libertarian theory held true, COVID should have been the catalyst for some kind of libertarian revolution. Yes. And where is it? <laughs> well, that's the, that's the point that you made. It's just like, well, if lockdowns wouldn't cause some sort of libertarian uprising, then they might as well turn their 3D-printed guns on themselves. Oh, that, I... was, that was towards the agorist people, yes. <laughs> well, it's still, though, it's true. It's just, well, what is the point of all this theory if there's no praxis? Uh, thank you thank you for the affirmations in the chat for our, our greatest ally. Oh, I... it's, it's everyone's greatest ally. And Don Hart. And Don Hart. I mean, there's another aspect to it as well. There is, I think, useful acts of useful elements of libertarian sort of social theory. Yes. Trying to explain to people the way in which inflation in, term, in money terms leads to civilizational breakdown in social terms because business itself and, quote-unquote, the, the incentive to engage in cooperation is marginally less as the money gets inflated away. That's a useful thing to recognise. And I think some of the little elements that were taken in steps towards essentially discussing private security measures yes. in a civilization where inflation is causing essentially crime, yes, that's a useful discussion to be had. It is. And it's a useful thing to organize around. My only worry is that people like ourselves don't have the resource to tap into that. If you spent years developing private security law and private security networks, <laughs> you're basically developing a new regime of bodyguards for people like George Soros and a strong cities network. Effectively, yes. You end up defending the very thing that you're trying to bring down, which is one of the one of the problems of the sheepdog, let's say. Mm. One of the problems of the Guardian, one of the problems of... the if you, if you talk about in the conservative given, which is if you give your all for your country and your country hates you, then what you should have done is stayed home. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that's the real uh, I mean, long and short of it. And, it, what, and what do all... A, a large number of these issues all revolve around that there is no scope in libertarianism for a friend-enemy distinction. No. There I... is no gatekeeping. And as those who have watched uh, our, our good friend uh, Pavarotti today yes. batter people about on Twitter about it, Christianity is the same. Yes. If you say, I am a Christian, I wear the cross, I go to church, it becomes very difficult for someone else to say, you're not a Christian, without getting into a very, very autistic discussion about doctrine. Yes, it becomes... In the same sense, I'm for freedom, I'm for liberty, and the free market, and free set, and blah, 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 and whatever. I'm a libertarian now, and you can't say otherwise, unless you want to have a, you know... There is no simple friend-enemy distinction that says, you are and you aren't. Never mind having an organisation that can then proliferate that friend and enemy distinction. That's a different story. Now, ultimately, the maximalist version of libertarian theory is itself a form of ideological prison. It still buys into the idea of a victory gained through having better ideas. Uh, it adds complexity to very simple issues in many cases. And very often it invokes practiological and axiomatic knowledge without invoking 
some concept of the Almighty. Mm. Uh, Hopper does better in that, in that he does invoke God and basically says that the Ten Commandments are a better guide than any form of libertarian theory is, which I agree with. You know, I'm, I've, uh, we've just basically knocked Christians a little bit for some of, well, online Christians, let's say. A lot of people who would consider themselves like Christ warriors in a Christian nationalist sense, I think are delusional in the same way as many of the libertarians are delusional in that they don't realize that they are, they do not represent their movement. Mm. And that we wouldn't call ourselves libertarians mostly just because of what other libertarians are. Yes. It, it's a quagmire and we, it's not about labels, it's not about ideology, it's about sitting down in a really simple practical sense with people and going, what do we do about all of this? Mm. Like it's it's there's a there's a uh, I can't remember who it was but there was an old online content creator I used to watch who was quite small and he used to talk about the fact that like living in the Midwest he didn't really care about the Democrats the Republicans he'd occasionally go off on these bizarre political runs that I thought were really good um, but he just said look we're drowning in corn syrup out here like where people are three hundred pounds for no reason they can't get any work like how how do we fix this like yeah. wh what's going to happen to us what's going to happen to my community. And it's just, I've seen so many people do this and be like, I don't care what your ideology is. Help me. Yes. And it's really horrible when you encounter those people. And libertarians go, oh, well, you have to believe in freedom and free your mind. Well, I was going to say, this, is, this, is, this almost relates to something I think I saw Woe's tweet earlier on, which was, uh, oh, yes, for sure. I believe that people believe the GOP is against mass immigration. <laughs> But no, um, it's 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 almost sort of as there you, it is. as you've seen on that discussion there, though it's almost a very similar situation to ourselves. Yes. You know, Tories doing this, Labour doing that, the foreign population in Britain doing this, the the loony lefty academics doing that. Whereas we live in lump and proletariat Northland. Yes. And it's just not here. No. When you go into Manchester, you see it. But the simple thing to do there is not go into Manchester. If you're out, if you're out in a working class British community, none of the problems that people talk about in terms of woke exist. Mm. Like you're supposedly the biggest problem around here, according to those people, <laughs> which is a bizarre thing since you are so heavily integrated in this community to the point that people in certain ways rely on you. Mm. Um, and it's nice, it's nice to be embedded in a community like that. But you start to realise is you you put out this piece years ago. Yeah, called, this is from. 5th of October 2021. This is, yeah, this is from October 2021. It's NAP not applicable to politics, in which you were talking about the Schmitting exception there, in which we talk about the fact that the libertarian theory has no method of dealing with friend enemy distinction. It has no method for the existential struggle. You, you can't have a libertarian NC, put it that no. way. <laughs> and it's, it's the, pro that's the problem with it. When you become, when you come under existential threat, when you deal with an enemy that does not regard you as human, that makes them stronger than you. Well, I, I feel almost obliged, and I'll, I'll put this out here as a little tip, but for yeah. people who haven't, either listen to you or reading of this or read the article version of yeah. it yet. But it's just the note from Lenin in the middle of it. Yes. To his uh, comrades at the start. I'll, I'll, qui I'll quickly Bolshevik grab this Revolution. because this, this is so excellent. Here you go. Here's, here is why you can't just be the bigger man. Comrades, the Kulag uprising in your five districts must be crushed without pity. You must make examples of these people. Hang. I mean, hang publicly so that people see it. At least a hundred kulaks, rich bastards and known bloodsuckers. Publish their names, seize all their grain, single out the hostages per my instructions in yesterday's telegram. Do all this so that for miles around, people see it all, understand it, tremble, and tell themselves that, they are, that we are killing the bloodthirsty kulaks and that we will continue to do so. Yours, Lenin. P.S. Find tougher people. <laughs> I just, I, again, w what if somebody like Lenin comes along? Mm. What if they just decide to kill you all? But my nap! <laughs> well, my no, nap. You're violating the nap, Mr. Lenin. Mr. Lenin, this this violates the... Excuse me, didn't you read my book? I, no, see, I see. <laughs> I used to have so many memes for this period as well because I, I remember having one that's like some really nerdy 
like guy, like the buck teeth and the glasses with the tape on it, pointing at like a big white billboard he's holding that just says constitutionally guaranteed no dying zone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for the five pounds that time, Steve. I love that one. In the same way feminists sometimes accidentally reverse engineer healthy sexual behaviour, libertarians sometimes reverse engineer yes. feudalism. It's true. Yes. It's like, yes, this place existed. It was called Medieval Europe and it was kind of cool. Um, thank you, S. Smith, for being a member for 32 months. Good Lord. Well done. Uh, thank you for supporting us. The whole problem you're discussing is that the internet made it too easy for absolute autists to join serious conversations. Well, we can't talk about that being weird, autistic, political people. Speak for yourself. Yeah, but, but, but no, you're right in that uh, opinions like arseholes, everybody's got one. Yeah. And we really try, again, not to waffle too much, even though we are quite theory-heavy in certain people's estimations. We try to break it down to very, very basic concepts. And this is basic. Like, look at what Lenin's saying. Mm. He's not saying anything that has to do with political theory. Where's the Marxism? Yeah, where, where's the Marxism? Where's the waffle? Where's the 15 different pages? The only, the only word in there that has any other contextual meaning is kulak. And Kulak can mean whatever you want it to mean. It means enemy. Yes. <laughs> it, it, this is this is the use of pure friend enemy distinction, and this is what this really boils down to: what a libertarian framework cannot handle. It cannot handle somebody who has real will to power. It, it's it, you know I I feel like. I guess we both feel like Colonel Kurtz reading this, don't we? Mm. It's just like the will, the will it takes to do that. The pile of tiny little arms. Yes. G the g horror. Give me, the give, horror. Give me 15 right-wing Lenins <laughs> and I will sort your problems. Yes. Overnight. <laughs> uh, where, where is the historical determinism, Mr. Lennon? He doesn't even accuse them of false consciousness. This is the barrel of a gun, that's where it is. <laughs> uh, it's very real politique. I suppose, really, we should not check out here, but we've got a little bit of discussion to talk about in, yes. uh, in terms of our conclusions. Uh, I'll let you do this bit and I'll do the, the quote we've got at the end. Sure. Ultimately, libertarianism, like conservatism and liberalism, is an ideology of principled defeat. Powerful, analytical, and logical tools cannot fight the realities of power. You cannot argue with the barrel of a gun. The world is not rational or fully explainable. And reconciling that, if that is not part of your ideology or part of your ideas, then you are doomed to failure because the yes. world is not rational and it is not explainable in totality. It is one of the key parts of the human condition the, the world is unknowable to you because of the limits of human thought the human mind and the human body and people talk about faustian ai nonsense and the totality of the system and understanding and understanding and the gaining of knowledge but really the problem is that you are human yep. and you must reconcile with this it's where the idea of the fall comes from it's where the idea of the human condition is tragic comes from and libertarianism, the ideas of individual personal freedom, cannot reconcile, as you said, with the tragedy of life. It's, it is something that I find just so... It's so babied in many ways. Well, yeah, it, it's a lesson that so many people have failed to learn. Yes. You cannot bring heaven to earth. No. <laughs> no, it's... Uh, I, the thing is, I invoke natural rights occasionally but oh, I, I always add the caveat that it comes from a higher power mm. you must say that the elevated status for humans is because they are differentiated they have the spark of the divine in them they are differentiated beings in many ways that's the only invocation of natural law i would use and that you, you know you must recognize other people's humanity but you cannot recognise other people's humanity if they refuse to recognise yours. Yes. <laughs> and that really is what the, the friend-enemy distinction is about. Uh, and there's one sort of final bit for us to go over, which is possibly maybe one of my, I think, favourite just quotes in general. Yes, this is Oswald Spengler, and this is from Man and Technics. There is director's work, and there is executant's work. And this fact has been the basic technical form of all human life ever since. Whether it is a matter of hunting big game, or building temples, 
an enterprise of war or of rural development, the founding of a firm or of a state, a caravan journey or a rebellion or even a crime. Always the first prerequisite is an enterprising, inventive head to conceive the idea and direct the execution, to command and to allot the roles. In a word, someone who is born to be a leader of others who are not so. And I think that once you fully understand that polarity, all forms of libertarianism, liberalism, or anything else that taps into the slightest amount of equality must be completely done away with. And you really come through to the position where we are, which is that ideology is something that you use once you are ruling. Yes, ideology When you is... aren't ruling, it's a shackles. It is. Ideology is, as we've talked about, is post hoc to power. Mm. The elites act, then they justify the action. <laughs> that is what happens. That is how all power is exercised. Power is exercised and then explained. And often, if you have a good enough relationship with your elites, as often would happen in, you know, a monarchy is more honest than democracy because a king will simply say, It's a decree. I have willed it. Yep. A democracy will not be honest to you in that degree, and people see that as comforting. They see the layer of ideology as comforting. They see all of the reasoning as comforting, but it's mostly because they do not want to live in reality. And that ultimately is our problem and why we came through libertarianism. Yes. Is that it does not deal with reality. And that is, the I think, the ultimate sin of a set of ideas is that it... People have noticed that our framework is quite incisive when it comes to dealing with certain aspects of the future. We get a lot of help because the regime likes to telegraph their attacks, as I've talked about before. But really, once you have a set of ideas that interfaces with reality as its primary function, then you're able to filter it better and also predict it better. It, a lot of the stuff is so simple when you think about it. Um, but a lot of it has been obfuscated just by layers and layers and layers of theory. You know, there are elites. These elites act as a class. They act as a class in their self-interest. They have inter-elite disputes, but when it comes to defending themselves loyal as a class... Loyal to the class yes. comes before loyalty to the serfs below them. Yes. And loyalty to the class comes before consistency in terms of ideas. Yes. Loyalty to the class even comes before popular sentiment. Yes, it does. Because popular sentiments can always be rewritten. And it's very clear that there is, you know, it's, as we talk about, as everyone talks about, it's a big club and you're not in it. Yep. It's all these really simple ideas, but when you add them together and you apply them in a consistent manner where they can be applied, then it gives you much more powerful analytical tools than a simply a theory-crafted version of reality in your head that you attempt to apply to the facts. Yes. I will also say as a disclaimer... This stream is not an excuse to go and bully your libertarian friends because the majority of them are probably retarded and that's not quite fair. No, that isn't but quite fair. But please to gently kick them in the direction we are discussing here over and over and over and over again. And if they don't get what you're on about, maybe you should consider getting better friends. Yes, uh, before we close out, I'll quickly say you can donate uh, Google Tax Free via the Ko-Fi and you can join the Anti-Politics Substack if you wish to support us. And please do interact with the video. Please do drop a like and all that. I know it's gay youtube -y stuff, but we, it, you it makes a huge difference. It if actually you does. interact with the stream, other people will see it. Yes. I'm afraid that's just the way it works. That is the way it works. If we could... Tell people not to interact with it, and that would make it popular. We'd do that instead. But we would it doesn't. do. <laughs> you have to play, You have to make some. Even we have to make some concessions, as what other people have quite rightly described as political hipsters. Um, we are a little bit. We do try to be the cool kids, but we also do try and be practical with it, and try and have a bit of fun with it as well. Yes. So as, it's been a slightly more, not maybe not scattered, but slightly less focused and. Uh, contemporary and relevant stream that we've done this evening but it's definitely something that we've both been through and have discussed a number of times and see people who are kind of fall have followed us along through it and we just thought it was important to essentially put it out there as a discussion i also think that as much as people make fun of libertarians 
I I think that simply autistically trying to kick at other people's political theory is not the best thing to do. No. You should really, as we try and do, one, point out the areas where you are being contained practically, and two, figure out ways to move beyond that, which is a lot of our current project is about how do we move forward as native people as Britain? How do we move forward as people who believe in the traditional world? How do we move forward as representatives of a much older set of ideas in many ways? That is what concerns us more than going, ha ha, you have really autistic ideas. It's why we don't debunk leftists. It's why we don't go out there and talk about Marxist theory, because if if you need to have that debunked for you, then you're quite frankly in the wrong place. Mm. The power politics in it are very powerful, which is why we invoke Lenin and why we quoted Lenin there, because that is not a political position. It is a practical one. Mm. <laughs> uh, thank you once again for the two pounds, Connie Current Year. It says, don't be a theory cell. Yes. Where, well, that's why the sub stack is called anti-politics. It was deliberately called that because that's what it is. It, it <laughs> is a collection of anti-politics. It is to make you lose faith in ideology, in political parties, in political systems, and to see ways that you can act within your own community that is positive. Well, to help you personally reject political engagement on its face. Yes. Because that is ultimately, you know, as much as, you know, we discussed Hopper's strategy of delegitimizing democracy in an intellectual sense is useful... Really what you want is the mass disengagement from politics as a whole, either as a consequence of some sort of miraculous shift in consciousness, which isn't going to happen, or more likely the consequence of some sort of large-scale collapse of complex systems. Mm, Big screen collapse. (laughs) Anyway, we shan't waffle any longer. We shan't be theory cells. Thank you to all of you who support this channel. Thank you to everybody watching. Thank you to all those people who engage in productive discussion with us. We're very grateful to have an audience. We're very grateful to have people who are willing to show up in person. There will be some announcement about events at some point when our lives have stabilised a bit more. Yes, um, whenever that happens. When, whenever that happens. I'm afraid we have just been bombarded with life, so we can't really guarantee the quality that we'd usually do with our live events. But they will come back. We promise you yeah. that. The by moment, hook or by crook. The moment we think it's even marginally possible for us to put something together, you will hear about it. Yes. Anyway, thank you guys for watching and have a good evening. Go to the pub. Yes. 